the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Karl Marx famously said, religion is the opiate of the masses. In other words, the reason why we have religion, theology, is because we're too stupid, we're too dumb to come to grips with the reality that there is nothing in this universe. We are all that it is. That's it. And so in order to make ourselves feel better about the eternal nothingness, we invented religion for ourselves. And indeed, as we see Christianity, Judaism, Islam on the decline, in which the fastest growing group of individuals are the nuns, nuns spelt N-O-N-E-S, meaning no religious affiliation, we see this dire statement coming to fruition. We see people more and more leaving the church, becoming disillusioned with Christianity. And we have to ask ourselves, why? Why are they leaving the churches? Why are they leaving Christianity? Most often they cite the reason is inauthenticity, that they see hypocrisy in the churches. One could ask, don't they understand the theology of the church? Don't they understand the meaning of the church? There is no meaning for them. There is nothing deep for them. And so it is that Great and Holy Lent presents for us on the first Sunday of the Great Fast, the Sunday of Orthodoxy, the triumph of Orthodoxy, in which the Church commemorates the restoration of the holy icons into the Church. Because for a period of over a hundred years, icons were illegal in the churches. Indeed, many holy fathers and mothers died and were tortured because of their insistence that we have icons in our worship, in our homes, to venerate and to love. Within the icons, we see the great feasts. Within the icons, we see our saints who we love. Within the icons, we see the face of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who became human for our sake. And perhaps this state of the church was prophesied even from back then. For the Holy Church, in her wisdom, sets today's gospel passage, the only gospel passage that is not according to Mark, during Great Lent. All of the other Sunday Gospels for Great Lent are going to come from the Gospel according to Mark. But today, we experience the Gospel according to St. John the Theologian. St. John the Theologian, whose Gospel starts Pascha, in which we declare, God is the Word. The Word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word. But in today's Gospel passage, we see our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ approach Philip, and then Philip approaches Nathanael. Nathanael, who was from the village of Cana in Galilee. And he says to him, we have found the one. We have found the Lord of whom Moses and the prophets speak, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And we see Nathaniel's response, really? You really believe that? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He says this for two reasons. One, he has studied scripture. And he sees that the Christ doesn't come from Nazareth. The Christ comes from Bethlehem. Second, Cana of Galilee is not that far from Nazareth. They're like sister cities. So he knows everything about Nazareth. So how in the world could there be anything good, anything holy coming out of Nazareth? 
So we see Nathaniel is full of doubt, just like the young people and even the older people in today's world are, full of doubt. Now, does Philip tell him, go and read a book about the faith? No. Does he tell him, go and watch a podcast? No. (laughs) He tells him, come and see. Come and experience what we know to be true. Come and experience something real. And so Nathanael begrudgingly accompanies Philip to Jesus. And as they're coming, Jesus said, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile, no dolos. He is making a character statement about Nathanael. Who is Nathanael at his core? At his core, he's an honest, good person. He is somebody that represents the kingdom of Israel in truth. So one has to ask, just as Nathaniel asks, how do you know me? How do you know my person? Now we know from the Gospel of John, just prior to this pericope, that Jesus Christ knows everybody. He knows our hearts. He knows who we are on the inside. But Nathaniel doesn't know that. And so he asks Jesus Christ, how do you know me? Jesus Christ answers him, when you were under the fig tree, before Philip called you, I saw you. Now, as I myself learned from Dr. John Fotopoulos at our most recent Lenten lecture, this has biblical antecedents. Because within the Old Testament, the idea of sitting under the fig tree to study scripture is something that is known in Israel as someone that is theologically sound. But that is not enough to merit the response that Nathaniel gives Christ at this answer. He declares, you, Rabbi, are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. That's a mighty big swing from can anything good come out of Nazareth to you are the son of God. So how in the world does Nathaniel bridge the gap from I don't believe in this to I believe entirely in this with every ounce of my being. I know who and what you are. You are God. The answer comes with the verbiage used. For Nathaniel most certainly was praying and sitting under the fig tree. But that doesn't necessarily mean anything. During the time of Christ, people prayed out loud. They would pray in the Oran's position out loud. This is why Jesus Christ says when he talks about how we ought to pray, when he says pray in secret, that was something novel. That was something strange. The idea of going home and praying in front of your proskinitarion was not something that they had. People would pray publicly. So Nathaniel praying out loud would not have merited that. Anyone could have seen him doing that. So it means that Nathaniel must have been praying silently. Now, if Jesus Christ had said, I heard you, that might have meant, okay, he heard that you were praying. That might elicit that response. That might elicit, you are God, because you heard me praying. Only God could hear me praying. But Jesus Christ doesn't say, I heard you. He says, I saw you. So what does that mean Nathaniel's prayer must have been? Nathaniel's prayer most likely was the same prayer that many of our young people have in today's world. Do you see me? How many people are alone in this world, completely and utterly alone, even though they're surrounded by people? How many of them leave our churches because they feel, I don't belong here. No one sees me. No one acknowledges me. No one even cares to say hello to me or engage me. This is something we see often in our churches. As the young people leave, they leave not because they don't understand our theology, 
Many of the adults don't understand the theology. They leave because they are not engaged. They leave because they are not met with love. And so they ask that question, do you see me? Do I matter? Does my existence mean anything? And so when Jesus Christ says to Nathanael, I saw you, that is Nathanael's prayer. God, do you see me? Yes, I saw you. That pierces Nathanael to his very soul. That is what elicits, you are the king of Israel, you are the son of God. Now you can imagine, that's amazing. But Jesus Christ says, you believe because I said that? You are going to see greater things than this. Can you imagine that? Even greater things than having your prayer answered in such a personal way. You will see the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. My beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, come and see is the invitation. Come and see to experience Christ our God in the way that he showed us. He didn't come with just words. He came in his personhood himself. He dwelt among us. And because he dwelt among us, we can draw him. Because we draw him, we can venerate him. And so it is important today, as we celebrate the procession of the holy icons, which we shall do in just a moment, that we understand how significant this is, how experiential this is, how important it is that we have icons in our proskinitaria at home, how important it is that we have icons in our bedrooms, so that we can venerate the saints, so that we can worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by actually kissing his hand or kissing his feet, but never kissing his cheek. As it says, I shall not give you kisses to Judas. My beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, we must invite other people who are alone, who do not feel that they belong, back into the church. They must feel that this is their home, where they are loved, where they are engaged, where their faith is enlivened and enriched. Come and see the beauty and the triumph of orthodoxy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.